I mean, do you really wonder why ordinary priests do not speak up? It's out of fear, dear family. Fear. Shame on the hierarchy who covers up truth through a conspiracy of fear. Fool me, we can't get fooled again. Hey, welcome back in to Talking Catholic with David O'Grey. Hey, this video is a monologue about the threat that's being issued against uh, Father James Altman by his bishop. Um, so as a monologue, it's a little bit longer than the monologues I'm used to doing, but bear with me because there's a lot that we need to talk about here to flush out. And I want to make sure I hit all the points so we can just do this one time and protect our priests. I want to start off here with one of my favorite verses from the entire Bible. It's from the book of Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 7 through 9. And it says, So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Um, I've believed for a long time that God is still in the business of making watchmen for his house, Israel, the church. And I've come to believe that Father Altman is one of those watchmen. Unfortunately, his bishop, His Excellency, William P. Callahan, a Franciscan, is a natural man. And being a natural man, and being um, a natural man who wants to please people in the world, he's fallen into a trap. A trap that all natural, natural men do. And today, on September 9th, he released a statement regarding uh, Father James Altman. And this statement is unsigned and released by the Director of Communications, um, of public relations. Now again, Bishop Callahan is a natural man and that's why this is a public relations issue. Right? And so I'll read the letter to you in whole and then what we'll do, we'll revisit Father Altman's sermon on compromised Catholicism just to see what the problem may be. If there's actually a scandal here, if he should be being be, be threatened this way. And then I'll close the talk up with a couple of my comments about what I think about this whole matter. And I'd like to think, like to um, hear what you think about this matter in the comments below. So the statement regarding James Alban, it says, Father Alban has become a social media phenomenon and is now um, a mainstream media story. The amount of calls and emails we are receiving at Dias and office show how divisive he is. Divisive. I'm being pressured by both sides for a comment. One side holds him up as a hero or as a prophet. The other side condemns him and vilifies him and demands that I silence him. He says, as I review Father Altman's latest video statement from the 30th of August, 2020, I understand the undeniable truth that motivates his message. When we approach this, these, um, we, when we approach issues that are contradictory to the faith and teachings of Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, Particularly on abortion and other life issues, we should invite dialogue and heartfelt conversion to approach the truth. Um, our approach must never seek to divide, isolate, and condemn, he says. Now, take note here of these three trigger words, divide, isolate, and condemn. I think these were like the same words that Rachel Maddow used to describe President Trump's nomination acceptance speech. You know, she's saying it was divisive. He was talking about isolationism it was mean bad orange man All right so it's like the same liberal talking points right um, so he continues that being said is not only the underlying truth that needs to be evaluated but also the manner of delivery and tone of his of his message so here the bishop sides with the complainants and their sensitivity to tone saying unfortunately the tone of father altman offers comes off as angry and judgmental lacking any charity and in, in in a way that causes scandal scandal he says both in the church and society 
his generalization and condemnation of entire groups of people is completely inappropriate and not in keeping with our values of life and virtue. Then he says, I'm applying the gospel principles to the correction of Father Altman here. He's talking about from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 16. <clears throat> talking about if your brother does something wrong to you, go to him, talk to him, and tell him what he has done. If he listens to you, you have kept your brother as a friend. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two others with you to talk to him. He says, I have begun this process, not in a bright light at a public arena, but as the gospel dictates in private. Can a law in a case that before penalties are imposed, we need to ensure that fraternal correction, rebuke, or other means of pastoral solicitude will not be sufficient to repair the scandal. So, <clears throat> Citing canon law 1341, which gives the bishop the authority to take whatever means he wants to against the priest, especially, um, essentially what we see here is really just a weighty threat. That if Father Altman does not do what his bishop wants him to do, that um, it gives um, the bishop the liberties to do whatever he wants to do to the priest, right? Which could go as far as um, sending Father Altman to the loony bin and receive some shock therapy. I'm not being hyperbolic here. That's just a fact. You know, they do do that. He goes on, most people expect a decisive move from me one way or the other. Note this. He says, many suggest immediate penalties that will utterly silence him. Others call for complete and unwavering support of his views. Then he says, canonical penalties are not far away. So he's siding with the former group, those who want him utterly silenced. Because he's saying... Canonical penalties are not far away if my attempts at for <coughs> excuse me. If my attempts at fraternal correction do not work. So again, he's saying if Father Altman does not do what I want him to do, you know, I'll go to those extreme measures, right? So he says, I pray for Father Altman's heart and eyes may be open to the error of his ways, that he might take steps to correct his behavior. And heal the wound he has inflicted on the body of Christ. My gosh, I just wish, you know, the heretics in the church would receive a letter like this. I mean, has, has I mean, I mean, you know, I'd hate to be that guy, right? Because I don't like the, I don't think that's really sufficient argument to point out hypocrisy. Because hypocrisy is a problem in itself. But... You know, sometimes you're just compelled to point out the hypocrisy. I mean, has Jamie Martin, the Jesuit, ever received a letter like this? I mean, you know, but a, a good priest like Father Alban received his letter. He prophesied this in his talk. He said that this would happen, and we'll get to that. But the letter closes. He says, pray for me as I address this issue, and pray for Father Alban that he might hear and respond to my fraternal correction. All right. So please pray for the church that we might seek the truth and charity and apply it to our daily actions, right? So this whole let's be nice thing, right? Let's be kind. Let's just, let's speak the truth, but let's say it in a way that sounds like a lie, right? This, this whole thing. So, yeah, so that that's the letter from um, uh, really a threat by Bishop Callahan against Father James Altman. So it's worth our time here just to revisit the context of Father Altman's sermon as objectively as we can to see if he actually did cause a scandal in the Catholic Church. If it was, and if it's really worth making a priest disappear and compel him to um, go into hiding or have us take him to hiding out of fear of his life. So I hope you watch the video. If you don't, click um, the link below in the, um, the uh, description box. So you can watch the original one or you can watch the one that we did. We're reading popcorn. We're enjoying hearing the truth. So listen to one of them if you haven't already. Because what I'm going to do here, I'm not going to have a whole lot of video. I just have, I want to highlight what he said. And then I'm just going to contextualize it. And let's see if there's some scandal or error here. Okay. So now, if you recall, the Father Altman, he began his sermon by drawing from the first two questions of the Baltimore Catechism. Really, to make the case that we're called to know, to love, and to serve God. And it is because that too many people do not know him, 
Um, they do not love him because they do not know him or love him. They do not, they do not serve him. That's really just the opening of a sermon. And it's good. There's no scandal. No one should no one should even raise that issue. So next he states that as an example of, of the fact that too many people are not knowing, loving, and serving God, as it was in Noah's day, he says, as he was during Sodom and Gomorrah, it, it, is, it is now. The world has gone wicked. The evidence of the fact that prove that this wickedness is plainly evident is when we look at various politicians, the godless educational system. These institutions do not serve God because they do not know him. That is the thesis of his sermon. Still no scandal. Just one man's observation of the evidence that is being contextualized through the lens of a faithful Catholic. Okay, next, Father Altman, um, he sort of prairies his, his opponent's blow. He preempts their attack, right? Um, because he knows that they're, they're going to rail against him, you know, for bringing up politicians and politics. And he, he quotes them, and he's saying that, um, that oh, Father Altman, you're just being too political. Politics that have, have no place in the church. And he imagined his interlocutors saying, um, saying these things, right? And he calls this baloney. And then he cites Pope Benedict in saying that the church is not a political party. It's not a political party, but the church is a moral power. Therefore, since politics should be a moral enterprise, not a corrupt enterprise, a moral enterprise, the church in this sense does have something to say about politics. Therefore, when politics and politicians act immoral, Catholics, Christians must, they do have a duty to speak up and speak out. We have an obligation to. Still no scandal. Just one Catholic quoting the Pope. So now that Father Altman, he's grounded his theses that society is, is bad, how it is today, godless, is because we do not know, love, and serve God. He uses the multiple catechism, scripture, the evidence of the fallen state, the, the state of politics and religion, of, in education, he cites Pope Benedict, and now he believes he has some sure footing um, here to really bounce off of that, jump off of that, to cite more examples of a godless society. <coughs> and the inclusion of examples, um, Jesuit Jamie Martin, who he calls a hyper confusion spreading heretic, who he says was the premier speaker at the Democratic Party National Convention. I think that part of his talk is some strong stuff there, but. We have to recall that it's Jamie Martin, a Jesuit, who's the one that is diverging from church teaching on the genesis, the origin of, um, of homosexuality. Jamie Martin is the one that's is saying that God, by his divine will, creates people with a natural and permanent attraction to the same genders. That's a heresy. And he's obstinate about that, which means that Jamie Martin is a heretic by definition. That's just a fact. James Martin is a heretic. Father Altman is not. Father Altman states the fact that because the Democratic Party platform is against everything the Catholic Church teaches, that we cannot be a Catholic and a Democrat. Again, that's a plain fact. That's true. For the very same reason why a Catholic cannot be a communist or a Catholic cannot be a Freemason, a Catholic cannot be a Democrat. Unless someone wants to argue with me that the Democratic Party does not actually espouse communistic principles. If someone wants to argue with me that it is not actually waging war against the Catholic Church, if someone wants to argue with me that it is not um, the, uh, the Democratic Party does not actually promote intrinsic evils in its party platform and consistently tries to legislate intrinsic evils. So there's nothing scandalous about speaking the truth. But Father Altman does not just leave it there. He calls those who, su who support that godless party to repentance or or to face the consequences of living life in league with Satan. He then affirms the fact that there is a hell. But he is even charitable in not mentioning Bishop Robert Barron's name here, as the well known cleric he calls it, who is properly known for advancing Balsadar's idea that we could have a reasonable hope that all men would be saved. Next for all men goes on to talk about <laughs> excuse me. Talk about the abortion genocide, saying that 60 million aborted babies will be standing at the gates of hell, barring your democratic entrance, and that there's nothing 
that you can say that will ever excuse your direct or indirect support of that diabolical agenda, he says. Later, he says that zero faithful Catholics voted for Obama. Those are hard sayings right there. He does sound like he is condemning a whole objectified group of people. But let's step back for a moment and ask the question. One, is murder a grave sin? Yes. Two, does the church teach that those with unrepentant grave sins will face the hellfire? Yes. Therefore, what he said was completely true and not scandalous. Certainly, some might like not might like his tone. Bishop Callahan says he sounded angry and judgmental. But since when is uh, righteous anger a sin? Since when does righteous anger need correction? And yes, he was judgmental. And there's nothing wrong with judging actions. Jesus calls us to call to judge a tree by its fruits and not to judge things that we are ourselves guilty of. But we must judge actions to know the truth from the lie. And Father Altman has done that here because he is a watchman. I completely understand why those who are in league with Satan are upset about this sermon. I understand why those who do not um, know, love, or serve God are upset about Father Altman's words here. If I were a Jesuit with Jamie Martin or a surrogate of Joe Biden, I would be calling him the bishop too. If I were the president of Notre Dame, um, the university who Altman criticized for giving Barack Obama an honorary degree, I would be giving my wealthy alumni in, in the Diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin a call too. To have them lean on Bishop Callahan, telling him that they will close their wallets if he doesn't do something about this parish priest. Who does he think he is? If our Planned Parenthood, who Altman called the most racist organization on this planet, I would be calling people um, who knows Bishop Callahan to threaten him, telling him that they're going to close their wallets. Who does this little parish priest think he is? If I were Archbishop Wilson Gregory, I would be calling Bishop Callahan and threatening him, threatening him his position as bishop. I would be saying, oh, you know what we did to the the Memphis, the what was his name, Bishop Martin Hawley over there in the Diocese of Memphis when he, he didn't play ball, right? No one has heard from him since, right? You want a bigger diocese one day, right? More money, more power, right? Then do what I say. Censor that little parish priest. Come down hard on him. Send him away to the insane asylum if you have to. Who does he think he is? You know. That's what I would do if I was Wilson Gregory. And I know you guys are smart enough to know what this is all about. The, there, there's only really two times when most of our bishops do anything. God help them. <laughs> they will only move a finger to do anything when either their money or... Or their position is being threatened. Now I'm not going to assume which one this bishop is protecting. But we all know that it's either one or the other. That is just a fact. And we do not have to pretend <laughs> that it isn't that anymore. We know what it is. We know what this is about. But back to our analysis of, of the video. So next Father Altman defends President Trump. By pointing out. Um, all those people who are attacking him, like, and his wife, <laughs> like um, Wilson Gregory, um, St. Anthony Messenger, the Sovereign Poverty Law Center he talks about. Then here really is the most prophetic statement in Father Altman, James Altman's um, sermon. He foretold the day when his own bishop will come after him. Take a look. You know, as a bishop recently said to me, it's no wonder... The faithful have lost confidence in the bishops because so many of them did such a horrible job on the scandal. And still to this day, don't say anything about the worst miscreants. Oh, but they sure will get all over a priest instantly who simply speaks the truth. Oh, yes, dear family, they are quick as lightning when they want to be to silence any priest who dares to step out of line. I mean, do you really wonder why ordinary priests do not speak up? It's out of fear, dear family. Fear. Shame on the hierarchy. 
who covers up truth through a conspiracy of fear. But he encourages us in the tone of a martyr that it is worth speaking up and to let the arrogant and the proud in the hierarchy know that the laity are suspicious and that they need to straighten out this problem that they created or else they're going to lose more of the faithful to what he calls the largest growing denomination um, that he calls ex-Catholics. Father Alban closes uh, with a call to discipleship. He closes the sermon with a call to discipleship. I mean, what's scandalous about that? He calls us to know, to love, and to serve God. And so basically, the outline of the whole talk is this. The whole sermon is this. Is one. He outlines that this is why the world is how it is. Too many people do not know, love, and serve God. Number two, here are some examples to show the consequences of us not knowing, loving, and serving God. Then three, here at the end, he says, let's turn back. Let us repent. Let's correct this thing together. He's begging us to do this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But for this, his bishop is saying he needs correction. And, and this is why his bishop is even threatening him to do, if he doesn't do something like issue some public apology or take down a video that worse will come. Are you serious? See, this is why. This is exactly why you are losing us. Now, the faithful voice, the faithful Catholics, we're not going to not be Catholic ever. Because where will we go? You have the word of eternal life. You have the Eucharist. But time and time again, you give us no reason to trust you or to believe that you really care about the health of our soul. Time and time again, you side with the lie, with the enemy, over the truth. This is why you do not attract more good men, more real men, to the priesthood and the diaconates. It is sad. It really is. And it's completely avoidable if you stop clinging to the world in all of its entrapments. And I'm, I'm going to close this talk with a, a story from the book of Acts, chapter 5. Um, when, when Peter and the apostles, remember the story, the Peter and apostles um, stood before the council and they spoke the truth about Jesus Christ, refusing the, the council's command that they be silent, not ever speak the name of Jesus again. And after Peter and the apostles told the high priest that we must obey God rather than men, they want to kill them when they said that. They want to kill them on the spot for their insolence, for their not falling into line with the religious establishment for not doing what they wanted them to do, how they wanted to do it. But a Pharisee named Gabaliel, a teacher of the law who was held in honor by all people, he stood before the assembly and recounted the history of each time someone who came claiming to be someone. And each time when that person died, their followers faded away. So he reasoned with the council that if Jesus of Nazareth is just like all those other men, then these men in assembly today will they'll also lose their energy they'll move on and all their media efforts will fail but then gamaliel adds if it is god you will not be able to overthrow them you might even be found opposing god listen to these words bishop callahan think very carefully about your next move because you too have a father and your judgment day is fast approaching. For the faithful lady, I offer you the same words of wisdom as I did last time when we sat together and ate popcorn and listened to Father Altman's wise words. Keep watch and pray. Keep watch and pray because your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. But until then, and until next time, blessings and shalom to you and to yours. Fool me, we can't get fooled again.